Today I'm in Texas where the air temperature is set to Hellmouth and after every blink I can literally feel the moisture evaporating off my eyeballs. This is the heart of America's oil industry, but I am here to see what could be a different future for energy. This isn't a fusion reactor, but it uses fusion technology, and it's not a sci-fi weapon, but it does shoot lasers. It's a device that hopes to drill the deepest holes on the planet, but it doesn't cut through rock, it vaporizes it. This is a story about a startup called Quaze, who are in the business of drilling hotter, deeper, faster, and stronger. You dropped it perfectly vertical, Morty, but perfectly f***ing vertical! I was invited out to Houston to see their prototype site firsthand. Quays are using a millimeter wave beam of light to superheat rock so that it either instantaneously vaporizes or starts to turn into this black glass-like material. Quays are piggybacking on existing oil infrastructure using the same rigs, supply chain, and expertise that have defined Texas energy for decades. But rather than hunting for oil, they are hunting for geothermal energy, an almost infinite source of power if only someone could finally reach it. Standing on a repurposed oil rig in the middle of Houston's industrial sprawl, I wanted to see how this futuristic technology was being made real, and understand the engineering challenges they were having to overcome to go from idea to reality. And here, so that you don't have to, I'll preemptively point out that I won the award for maximum exposed thigh area. While every Texan around me seemed completely unfazed in long trousers and button-down shirts, somehow barely even breaking a sweat. Quays are still in the R&D stage, the most interesting stage of being a company, sitting roughly around TRL or technology readiness level 6 or 7. Based on NASA's scale from I had an idea, TRL 0, to my idea is in space, TRL 9, they've passed that proof of concept lab demonstrator, like these melt samples we'll see, and are making their way out into the real world, but there is still a process of refining to get to the final engineered designs. And there are a ton of cool engineering problems that they're having to solve along the way. Before we get there, I want to give a little bit of context as to why it's such a difficult problem in the first place. The deepest hole humans have ever drilled was the Kola Superdeep Borehole in Russia, which now sits on an abandoned site below this innocuous plate. It took 20 years and reached 12.3 kilometers down. That's about nine Empire State buildings stacked end to end, which is impressive, but it's also less than one fifth of 1% of the way to Earth's core, and it cost about $100 million. But what stopped this project wasn't money, it was the Earth itself. You can get enough energy to the drill bit. If you're 10 kilometers down, the torque you put on the surface doesn't get to the bottom. It dissipates on the way there. As drills go deeper, the motor sits further away from the drill bit, and torque has to travel through kilometers of steel pipe, and at this length, the shaft begins to twist and flex, dissipating away force before it ever reaches the rock. And the second um, disadvantage that the drill bit faces is simply that as the rock gets hotter, your wear rate is faster, exponentially faster. Temperature rises about 30 degrees every kilometer down. At five kilometers, steel begins to soften, causing drill bits to wear out faster than usual. And replacing a drill head can take days of hauling thousands of meters of pipe back up to the surface, and further days to send it back down again. And all this to say, if you beat the heat, the rock itself becomes unpredictable. At 300 degrees under crushing pressure, it doesn't crack anymore like brittle stone. It flows like clay. This brittle ductile transition zone is the graveyard of every deep drilling attempt, and is the reason that tapping into the almost unlimited geothermal energy beneath our feet has always remained out of reach. That is, other than in places where geography brings it naturally closer to the surface. But if we could reliably dig a little deeper, around 5 to 10 kilometers down, we reach deep geothermal, and the potential of this energy is staggering. If you can drill deep enough, you need to do the whole process again, for two side-by-side -side holes, one to inject water down into the hot rock, and one to bring it back up again. At depths of 10 to 20 kilometers, the rock can reach 4 to 500 degrees Celsius. Back at the surface, that hot fluid is then directed through a turbine generating electricity, before being cooled down and re-injected back underground. This closed loop means that you're not consuming any water, just cycling it, and each well pair could provide tens of megawatts of steady round-the-clock power. The US Department of Energy estimates that tapping deep geothermal systems could provide over 90 gigawatts of electricity capacity in the United States alone by 2050, enough to power tens of millions of homes worldwide. And global studies by the International Energy Agency suggest that the total accessible geothermal resource could exceed 550 terawatts, more than 150 times the current global yearly electricity demand. However, conventional deep drilling is staggeringly expensive, and costs rise exponentially with depth. For example, studies on enhanced geothermal systems show that drilling the two wells required for geothermal energy down to 4 kilometers costs around 6 million euros, but doubling that depth, wells around 7 kilometers, costs more than 7 times the amount. 
That's a problem because the vast majority of deep geothermal energy is at the 10 to 12 kilometer range, making it economically unfeasible to ever actually access, unless you do something clever. After a quick safety tour and adding on the most ludicrous overshoes to my already kind of large feet, I was on site to see the system in operation. The first thing we saw was the pointy end of this technology, capable of delivering megawatts of energy into the rock to melt it out of existence. Which is why when we reached the rig, I was kind of surprised at the end of the waveguide to see this, which looks suspiciously like a drill bit to me. What is going on? We'll cover that, but first I have to thank today's sponsor, Alina. AI systems are trained on the entire internet, but the internet isn't exactly flawless. That's where Alina comes in, a platform that connects smart, skilled people with frontier AI projects, giving AI the much needed real human expertise to improve. Alina is looking for experts in math, coding, medicine, law, science, business, and languages. If you're sharper than the model, you can actually put that to work. Projects pay up to $150 per hour. They're remote, flexible, and match to your strengths. Alina are looking for a range of experts across all different levels, from experienced professionals to emerging talent. All are encouraged to join. Now, it is a competitive process and not everyone gets placed right away and access isn't guaranteed, but if you're selected, you could help shape how AI thinks and reasons. And if nothing else, it's a chance to finally prove you're smarter than the algorithm. So if you're interested, check out the link in the description down below. But now, back to that drill bit. What was going on? This is Matt Hood, one of the co-founders of Quays, who helped me understand. The drilling that we are doing right now, dominantly a metal drilling process and so what we are doing is because we are encountering a current limitation on power we're working to scale up we are melting the rock that melt is displacing along the walls of this hole and then we scrape off chunks of this melt with this mechanical scraper tool here it's much different than traditional drilling in the sense that we require much less torque and weight on this scraper tool to scrape off this melt, which is basically a weakly vitrified glass. So just to reiterate, at the moment at least, the way the team drills is to run a three-step cycle. When you're using a traditional drill bit, the cutting teeth are on the outside, which means it's always drilling a hole larger than the drill bit itself. But the microwave beam of energy that Quays are using to drill is on the inside of these waveguides. So to vaporize a hole big enough, they position the guide above the bottom of the hole by a set distance. As the beam emerges, it broadens a set amount and can melt a hole larger than the internal diameter of the waveguide. Guide. This means that they have to lower the waveguide at a constant speed as they melt, called the rate of penetration. When the millimeter wave beam then hits granite or basalt, the rock doesn't simply crack the way it would under a conventional bit. Instead, the intense energy rapidly heats the surface to thousands of degrees. Silicate rock starts to melt at around 1200 degrees, and vaporization begins at around 2000 degrees. What you're seeing here are some of the lab samples from the aftermath of this process. This melt material is reasonably fragile post-vaporization, so it can be easily scraped away by comparison to drilling through solid rock. So in the second step, the beam is actually turned off and the waveguide is rotated to scrape away the sidewalls with the drill head to smooth it into a perfect borehole. This is something the Quays are doing because they're in an early stage of development. This system they're using isn't running yet at full power, but they also want to precisely understand the exact rate of speed that their drill is melting material, or if it's leaving some debris behind, because this affects how quickly they are lowering the waveguide, which affects how wide of a hole that they might be drilling. In the final step, compressed air is blown down into the hole to clear out the vaporized rock and scraped debris, which is ejected into a water tank on the surface before the process happens all over again. What is really interesting is that this results in a borehole with a glossy vitrified lining, which is kind of an important outcome. Conventional drilling, after each segment of a hole is drilled, engineers insert steel casings and pump concrete down into the gap. This lining prevents the borehole from collapsing and stops fluid from leaking between the rock layers while keeping the drill string moving freely. What this means is that the deeper you drill, the thicker the lining needs to be to support the hole and the smaller and more expensive the hole becomes. Quasar's approach aims to bypass this by vitrifying the borehole walls directly, using melted rock itself in the lining instead of steel and cement. Here's a couple of sample cores that they extracted from the rock at this drilling site that shows the outcome of their drilling process. I got the opportunity to watch a few runs of this over the course of the visit and they were reporting about an average rate of one inch of progress every five minutes, which is slow compared to conventional drilling, but ultimately, once at full power, they'll be aiming to do around three to five meters per hour. Even the current speed is groundbreaking considering that you never need to stop for multiple days to change drill bits, and this is still a first of its kind system. 
But you might ask, what is driving the power needed for this process? That would be this box here, which contains something called a gyrotron, and was unfortunately off limits today as the team were running live demonstrations of the drilling process. But it's worth understanding before we go any deeper. A gyrotron is a type of vacuum electron device originally developed for nuclear fusion experiments, where it's used to superheat plasma and push reactors to temperatures hotter than the surface of the sun. It was while working at MIT's Plasma Science and Fusion Center, Paul Wozkov, a research engineer working with gyrotrons for fusion, had this radical idea if what if the same intense heating capability could be turned downward instead of inward? Rather than directed at plasma, it could instead vaporize rock and drill deeper than conventional methods ever could. The gyrotron works by accelerating electrons through a system that makes them spiral around magnetic fields at nearly the speed of light. This spiraling motion, called cyclotron resonance, forces the electrons to emit energy in the form of millimeter wave radiation, essentially a high-powered microwave beam. And here, the optical physicist in me needs to clarify, strictly speaking, a gyrotron doesn't produce a laser, it produces radiation in the microwave band, making it a maser. Quasar's current system produces around one megawatt of continuous millimeter wave power, enough electricity to supply roughly a thousand US homes at once, but these systems aren't 100% efficient. Depending on the setup, only about 30 to 50% of the input electrical energy actually makes its way into the usable beam. Quasar will soon be upgrading their system to use the full megawatt of power, and that's what should push them into a regime where they are vaporizing rather than melting the rock, making the entire scraping process not necessary. This energy energy cost is obviously significant, but compared to the near limitless geothermal power that could be unlocked when you get there, it is a small price to pay. In order to get the beam to the bottom of the borehole, these waveguides are really important. If you look at the inside of each waveguide, it contains these small couple of millimetre high ridges, which to microwave radiation acts like mirrors, bouncing the millimetre wave rays down the line without letting it scatter. It's not a million miles different from how the mesh on a microwave keeps the microwaves inside the microwave. What a confusing sentence. And obviously here, as the drill moves deeper, new sections of the waveguide have to be added one by one, just like the piping in conventional drill rigs. That produces an interesting problem though, because it means that the beam system has to be flexible enough to extend downward without breaking alignment. To achieve this, Quaves have designed a beam relay that you can see here, that is essentially acting like a periscope arm for the beam system. The arm uses precision mirrors to bounce the millimeter wave beam around corners and reposition the drill. These mirrors are coated with materials of greater than 99.8% reflectivity. For reference, household mirrors are about 90-95% to 95 reflective, but that extra 5-10% to 10 makes all the difference. If the mirrors aren't reflective enough, even a 0.2% loss from a 1 megawatt beam translates to 2 kilowatts of heat, absorbed at a turning point designed in the system to redirect, not absorb energy. And remember, if this beam is powerful enough to melt solid rock, it's certainly hot enough to melt steel. So each reflector assembly doesn't just sit passively in place, it is actively cooled with circulating water, carrying away tens of litres per minute to prevent catastrophic failure under the onslaught of microwave power. And just to make this one step more challenging, because the beam travels most efficiently if there aren't any air molecules to bump into and lose energy to, this whole system is kept for as long as possible under ultra-high vacuum. That is, up until the transition point here where the beam is split by a mirror, so that the majority of the beam is directed downwards into the borehole, but a small amount is siphoned off into the measuring equipment. So not only does this top system need to be kept under ultra-high vacuum, vacuum was capable of actuating, it also needs to carry a beam of light hot enough to instantly vaporize rock without melting itself, all with this goal of trying to flatten the cost curve so that deeper doesn't necessarily mean more expensive per kilometer. What Quays are really doing here is discovering for the very first time in the field just how to achieve this from an engineering perspective, and from a scientific perspective, just how superheated rock behaves when you turn it into a gas, liquid, or even plasma, in a borehole deep beneath the ground. All of this points a very challenging but positive picture as to just what Quays are trying to do and how well they are overcoming the challenges. But just to address one major point of contention, brought up by several of the other industry experts that were visiting the site alongside me that day, this purge gas system that they are planning works beautifully at shallow depths, but when you start talking many kilometers, moving fine particles and vaporized rock upward over that distance will require massive amounts of compressed air and industrial scale pumps to keep it flowing. That translates into more cost and more power consumption and more complexity. And that is before we even get into the more interesting questions like what if that rock cools down on its journey upward and starts attaching to the drill bit or to the borehole walls, ultimately sealing the borehole 
hole around the drill bit itself. In conventional drilling, usually this problem is solved by using a bubbled water flow-through system that brings material up to the surface. This isn't possible with Quasar's system because the millimeter wave beam is favorably absorbed by water. And if any was left in the hole below, it would dramatically reduce the efficiency of the melting process. Which brings another risk, the idea of supercritical water behaving like both liquid and gas and potentially forcing or permeating its way into the borehole, again absorbing huge amounts of energy and stopping the apparatus from drilling. But if this system does work, if we want to put it all in perspective, the Kola Superdeep borehole took nearly 20 years to reach 12.3 kilometers. At this very early rate of drilling with their prototype system that Quaze is already achieving, without even allowing for future efficiency gains, the same depth could already be achieved in theory in just a couple of years. When the drill is at full power, they hope to achieve this in as little as a couple of months. What's really interesting about these technologies is that they are aiming to push deeper and further than anything else has ever gone before. I'm always interested in how we get these breakthrough technologies actually operational as efficiently into the world as possible, and here Quays are taking a really clever approach in their commercial strategy. Both depth and heat are a problem for conventional drilling, but because Quays have built their system specifically to drill deeper and hotter, doesn't mean they have to tackle both of these problems at the same time. First, Quays will be targeting shallower, high temperature sites, placing their technology in a position where they can succeed where conventional drilling fails, and also meaning that they have more time to solve the ongoing challenges like using purged gas in ultra-deep wells, while not slowing down their time to revenue. Yeah, so we, we think about drilling capability as orders of magnitude. And we start with single digit meters, tens of meters, hundreds of meters, thousands of meters. That's the journey. We've done single digits, we've done tens. We're now doing hundreds. In 2026, we'll go to thousands. And in 2027, we'll do thousands at very hot temperatures. So we are two stops before the final stop for the technology to come into the stage and unlock project economics and access in a way that's not possible today. 2025 was a massive year for them. They debuted their first full-scale hybrid rig that combines traditional rotary methods with millimeter wave drilling. That is what this site in Houston is here to prove. And by next year, in 2026, Quays anticipates their first thermal energy extraction from a super hot enhanced geothermal system. And by 2028, Quays aims to deliver its first geothermal super hot power plant. What I really admire about Quays is their transparency. They're open to what is working and what isn't yet, and the lessons that they're learning as they go. That honesty is really refreshing, and it's also what engineering is really about, facing problems, testing solutions, and turning setbacks into the next step forward. Not only are Quays an excellent example of how far-reaching technologies like fusion can be applied into solving problems closer to home, they are inching the technology forward while also committing to an affordable delivery system, positioning them to completely reshape how the world is powered. If they succeed, drilling through rock won't just be boring, it'll be pretty hot. Links to follow them directly will be down in the description below. If you enjoyed this video, drop a like, subscribe to the channel if you're new, and I will see you in the next one.